Hi Angie. Thanks for stopping by. We're going to go live in just a couple of minutes here. Wait for everybody to join up. Hopefully everything looks good. I put a hat on so you didn't get so much of a glare off of the top of my head. Nanette's sitting right here too. Say hi Nanette. Hi. Hi Christopher. Thanks for joining. Hi Alejandro, how are you doing? Hope you're good. Hi Karen. Hi John, thanks for joining. We're going to get going in just a couple of minutes. So get your uh, gecko breeding questions ready and uh, I'll see if I can answer them. Fingers crossed. Hi Bonnie. Thanks for joining. So while we're waiting I thought I would bring out a couple of geckos. These are uh, crested geckos, as many of you probably already know. Let's see how they do coming out here. Hopefully you can see these guys. This is Cafe Mocha. This is one of our mochas. This is from a long line of mochas that we've had. Our original mocha, Mocha, was a uh, male's name, and Mrs. Mocha was the female's name are no longer with us, but uh, the mocha line continues. Hopefully this guy shows up pretty well on the camera. You can see the real dark, and, and this guy, is, I just uh, missed it and, and uh, fed just a few minutes ago. So they're just now coloring up. Hopefully he, you can see some of that dark color and the real nice light color on the, the back. Hopefully that works out. Karen Skinner joined. Hi, Karen. Let me bring out a Red Harley that we're working with just this year. Um, Cafe Mocha is about four years old. We've gotten some babies in the past few years from, from uh, that gecko, from that grouping. And again, we're just going to join in uh, the chat in just a couple of minutes. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them on the, the chat and I'll, I'll go ahead and answer them. So this is, uh, this is a Red Harley that we're working with, a little squirmy tonight. Hopefully, again, these colors show up on the camera. I'm going to calm him down just a little bit here, but hopefully you can see those colors. It looks like they're fading out because of the, the lighting here, but let's we'll see if we can get a... Number one, a calm gecko, and number two, a good shot of this guy's colors. Tyler joined. Hey, Tyler, how are you doing? Hi, Jerry. Can everybody see the colors on this gecko? It's really cool because, and he's taking off on my shoulder. Um, it's really cool because the 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 um, yellow on the red really appears real nice, full um, coloration. So I'm real, we're real happy about this gecko. So how is everybody's uh, breeding projects uh, coming so far this year? Are you thinking about breeding? Are you, uh, hi Christine, are you uh, starting your projects up? Are you starting to think about which uh, geckos you're going to, to put together? Hi Allison, it's been quite a while. Thank you for joining. So we've uh, started our process uh, already, and part of that process is going through and looking at the uh, geckos that we're going to breed. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining. Uh, go ahead and uh, hit the like if you would, everybody. Uh, would greatly appreciate that. Uh, we've put together a list of, of uh, uh, geckos that we'll be breeding this year, uh, putting the males and the females together. We have a lot of new geckos uh, coming up this year. Hi Doug, hi Andrew, thanks for joining. Uh, and we've put together a list and uh, the last month or so, uh, dead of winter, there's always something to do downstairs. And uh, one of those things is, hi Troy, uh, one of those things is to uh, make lists and try to work out the patterns of what we really want to accomplish with our uh, breeding projects. 
A lot of the geckos, like the African geckos, uh, are sporadically breeding. We're sporadically getting eggs. Um, and we're uh, putting together uh, the crested gecko list right now and putting them together and uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, waiting for the warm weather to, to start uh, showing up downstairs, start warming up the, the uh, downstairs and some, see some activity. Now, this last week... Hi, Robert. Thanks for joining. I'm glad that you got it to work. Um, this last week, uh, it's been about a month since we've gotten eggs, but this last week, and I, I don't know why because it's like single digits outside, but we've uh, got actually three eggs or three sets of eggs. Um, so I'm hoping that, hi Kent, I'm hoping that this starts the whole process with getting crested geckos uh, going with uh, uh, them laying. The gargoyles, uh, nothing from them yet. Uh, I'm certainly hoping that uh, once we start getting some warmer weather outside, it warms up the facility. Our facility is in the, the basement. So um, I naturally let everything uh, go as it is uh, and warm up, cool down, and then warm up as, as uh, nature provides. Uh, John asks, what is the best way to store crested gecko eggs? I usually use divided containers. I often see breeders use deli cups with multiple eggs and no air and no air holes. John, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I just wanted to show Cafe Mocha one more time and I'm going to grab something. Hi Kylie, um, that we use. So it's, uh, it's not breeding season downstairs right now. So I'm using the deli cups and I do have air holes. I think that's very, very important. Um, to have. Andrew, uh, how many crested geckos do you plan on pairing this year? Right now, I think I'm right around 50 different groups. So what does that mean? Uh, that could be a one-on-one, -on -one, one male and one female, or it could be a one in three. And, and I have some thoughts on the one three. I think that uh, putting together groups of uh, one male and, and uh, more than one female uh, isn't the best way to go as far as uh, production. It, it, it works out for us, uh, but I think as you add uh, females to the groupings, I think you you decrease the number of egg expect uh, that you can expect from each female. Okay, so box, box that one up. Uh, go ahead and add your uh, address there, Troy, and uh, it'll be in the mail tomorrow. Yeah. Famous last words. Um, Getting back to John's question, so right now we're getting a few eggs. Hi, Lori. Thanks for uh, coming online with us. Uh, so right now we're getting a few eggs. So I use deli cups uh, right now. Everything goes into a deli cup. They go on a shelf, and, and I wait the, the two months to... Uh, Nanette's telling me to slow down a little bit. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so we put them in deli cups right now, but in the uh, once the breeding season starts up, I'll start using these egg boxes. They're, um, hold it up to the camera here so you can see. They're actually these little tackle boxes, and pardon the, the writing on the top, but that's how I indicate which um, pairs have bred. I'll put a, a number, hopefully you can see a little bit of this, but I'll, I'll put a number on the top, and then I'll put a uh, the Crested Gecko, uh, the, the numbers for the Crested Gecko breeding group, um, I have names for everybody, but it's easier on these little containers to put the numbers, and then I'll put the date, so I have some expectation of when they should be uh, breeding or when they should be hatching. Casey has a question. So uh, Casey says, any special uh, requirements for uh, petri breeding? For pe oh, for petri breeding. I think that's the uh, the African gecko. I'll get to that in just a second. I'll finish this one up. Hi Hector, thanks for for joining us tonight. So I'll put the number, I'll put the date, and that gives me an expectation of about two months or so that they should be bringing all of our eggs, our crusted gecko eggs, hatch in the uh, low 70s downstairs facility again once, it, uh, once we start getting into the uh, spring-summer uh, temperatures. We get to be about 72 to 74 degrees downstairs, So, uh, and it, that's a constant temperature. It doesn't fluctuate hardly at all in the summer. So uh, we'll put them in these uh, containers, these tackle boxes, plastic tackle, tackle boxes or bead boxes. Um, I use Turfus 
uh, high uh, fired clay material. Uh, we wet it down uh, and then drain all the water off of the turface and then uh, put the turface material into the box. Then make a little divot and we'll put the eggs right in, in the divots. I do pretty much the same thing with the deli cups. Um, but I'll use perlite or uh, vermiculite. Um, I kind of jump in between. Uh, it just depends on whatever's handy and, and I'm pretty lazy that way. I'll find the closest thing that I can use and, and use it for incubation. And with a few years of, of experience, I, I kind of have a feel for how much it weighs with the amount of water to put in there so that I have the right uh, ratio of water to material. With the turface, it makes it a lot easier because I put in the water, I, I let it sit for about two or three minutes, and then I drain all the water off, so it works great. Um, Casey, you had asked about the Petri. I haven't uh, had the opportunity to, to keep those yet. I understand that they're a desert uh, type of gecko, um, a smaller uh, gecko, about three, three and a half, four, to, four inches or so. Um, I don't know if you have any, but uh, it's a great looking gecko, a lot of uh, fun. That's the scorpion tail gecko. Um, but I would anticipate that they have the same requirements as, as many of the African geckos. A lot of rock work, uh, out, rock outcrops, and uh, sand bottom. They'll probably, I think they'll lay their eggs in the sand, and you can go, go through and look for the eggs and, and uh, hatch them. Actually, uh, with the same boxes, but what I'll do is, uh, instead of putting eggs for African or Pictus geckos, uh, geckos like that, right in that material, that turface, that wet material, what I'll do is I'll take a bottle cap, I'll, put the, I'll use the same container with the turface in there, the moist turface, but I'll take another bottle cap, I'll put dry turface or vermiculite or perlite, anything that will stop the eggs from... Uh, uh, rolling around, and I'll put the <clears throat> excuse me. I'll put the bottle cap right on top of one of the uh, compartments, and what that does is it keeps the eggs dry, uh, but it also uh, exposes them to the humidity within that box. Now I don't put um, holes in the boxes, in the tackle boxes. I, the deli cups obviously have some holes, but the the um, the tackle boxes I'll open the lid about once a day maybe once every two days, uh, depending on how impatient I am. Usually it's once every two days or two times a day or ten times a day because I'm pretty impatient once they, once we start getting eggs. Um, there was a question about Angie, myth. Go ahead. Angie wants to know, do you, have, do you miss the eggs or do you leave them as they are? Uh, very good question. If we're using uh, perlite or vermiculite, I, I never missed eggs. Um, we always add water around uh, the edges of the, of the enclosure, of the container, if we're using perlite or vermiculite, or even turface. Um, we, uh, if it gets too dry, then we'll go ahead and add water around the uh, edges of the container, never ever on the uh, eggs. Usually, though, in those tackle boxes, the bead boxes, I seldom have to add water. Uh, to be very honest, in two months' time, uh, that turface will maintain that moisture because the top is, is virtually down the whole time. It will maintain that moisture, and very, very rare do I have to add any water. But if I do, um, I'll take a, uh, a wash bottle, a uh, bottle with a little, little nozzle, and I'll gently and slowly add water around the edges of each compartment. But again, with the, the bead boxes, that's such a rare occurrence. We see a lot of uh, people joining. Uh, I see CJ, and I missed a couple of people up here. Uh, George, uh, Kevin, thank you very much for joining. Again, if you would, if you like this information, if you like this content, uh, we're doing a live video every first Thursday of every month. And again, bring your questions, uh, and I'll, ex I'll share the experience I have with uh, breeding or with uh, anything about uh, geckos. Uh, I have a lot of good experience and I have a lot of bad experience and you can certainly learn from my bad experiences. Uh, Kevin says by weight loss then you add water. Great question. Um, so it's for me now it's more about feel. If I feel that the the uh, container I as I'm working with deli cups as I pick them up I can feel if they're uh, lighter and if they are, I'll kind of feel around the material. And if I feel that it's 
starting to be dry, I'll go ahead and add the water. <clears throat> For the turfits, it's a lot easier. The clay material, the brown clay material, it actually will, once you wet it down, it darkens up uh, considerably. Hi, Gene. Thanks for coming online. But once it dries out, it gets lighter. So it's real super easy to tell if it's getting, uh, uh, dry, if it's drying out or not. And once it starts drying out, obviously, I start adding the water. Uh, Casey says, do you add extra calcium to your food mixtures for your breeding uh, or females during breeding season? Um, I think that that's one of the keys for our success, to be very honest. Um, so during the summer uh, time, as they're breeding, uh, we're going through a normal breeding session. Hi, Christy. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, through the summer, the fall, I go through the normal. Um, yeah, what's the biggest mistake I've ever made since breeding? I'll get back to that one. Um, during the summer and fall, we'd go through a normal uh, session of feeding uh, crickets, uh, feeding roaches, dubias. Uh, we feed mealworms. You obviously feed the crusted gecko diet. Um, but then so, uh, winter comes and we s kind of slow down a little bit because it cools down in our facility. Once springtime comes up, um, I'll start throwing uh, mealworm cups in all the enclosures or making sure that every single enclosure has mealworm cups and will feed extra uh, crickets and extra dubia roaches, especially dubia roaches, uh, to the crusted geckos and the gargoyles. Um, and we make sure absolutely that we're uh, throwing... Hi, Dan. Thanks for uh, joining the conversation. Appreciate it. Um, and anybody can chime in on these questions. But uh, as far as extra calcium, it's in that springtime before uh, breeding season really kicks off. So it's right now, actually that we're uh, dousing the insects without extra calcium. So if I'm going through and I'm doing a feeding of crickets, I know Nanette's saying that I'm going too fast here, but uh, we'll see if we can get as much information in as we can. Um, so d right now, before the breeding season actually uh, kicks off, I'm throwing as much calcium on those insects as I possibly can. I'm feeding them just before uh, nighttime so that they have that calcium uh, on them when the uh, crested geckos are waking up and looking for food. And again, I have them in meal, mealworm cups where I also have uh, calcium as a, a, a substance at the bottom of the mealworm cups. So the ro roaches are crawling around in calcium dust and they're getting that extra um, dose of calcium. So um, to be honest, I don't know if I've ever had, maybe I have, maybe I haven't noticed it, but I don't think I've ever had a female crash because of calcium problems, uh, gargoyles or crusted geckos or, or even uh, shahuas. Uh, worst mistake, Angie was asking about the worst mistake I've ever made with breeding. Was it, uh, Nanette, did you see that? Was it with crusted geckos or just breeding in, in general? Crusted geckos, with breeding your crusties. Oh, gosh. Um <laughs> Yeah, oh, I, I've got one. Um, so we used to use plants. Uh, when I first started out, uh, the first year or so of breeding crested geckos, I used to use plants. And uh, it was a lot of work. It was, we had 12 animals set up. Um, but, you know, obviously with 12 animals, it's a little bit easier than having 40 or 50 or 60 breeding groups uh, to be able to do this. But 12 animals, um, about once a week, I would go through, pull the plant out, dig through the plant to get the, because the crested gecko females like to lay their eggs in the plant, in the, the dirt, obviously, in the plant. So I would pull them out, uh, shove all the dirt around, find the eggs, put them in cups, and, and uh, incubate that way. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I must have missed one once, and I don't know if, if you notice things with your animals, something can be off. Some, something can be different. I think a little bit of this is from fishing. I, I developed a sense of, you know, kind of knowing a uh, little, being able to point out little things about the environment, you know, especially with fishing, you know, if a little wave off to the side somewhere, that indicates that there's a fish working maybe through some school of, uh, of minnows. Well, you get a sense of everything going on in your, uh, I get a sense of everything going on in my facility. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining. Appreciate it. I get a sense for everything going on in the facility. So 
I walked past a tank uh, once and noticed something different. Uh, came back, you know, I kind of did that stop, looked back to the right, you know, and here was a little head popping out of the uh, the dirt. So I had obviously, you know, every time I did, dug in the dirt, I would look for those two eggs because they, they lay two eggs at a time. I must have missed one and... Uh, uh, a little gecko had uh, circumvented the whole process of me pulling the eggs and had hatched or had uh, stayed in the enclosure and or in the dirt and hatched on its own. So um, I don't know if that's a huge mistake, but, uh, you know, it certainly was, I think, kind of funny. Um, Casey wants to know, Yeah. Um, so you don't mix in with your powder diet so you're not mixing in calcium with your powder diet no i i never do that because i want <laughs> another you know i i think these are great questions these aren't obvious uh uh questions that you, you guys are answering i think that they're excellent questions i don't mix the powder with the diet because i want that diet i want that diet to be taken every single time because the gecko knows what it should taste like and knows what it 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 feels like i don't want any kind of a difference in that that gecko's um, uh, impression of what that diet actually should taste or feel like. So I don't ever do that. So in the, uh, again, in, in the springtime especially, and I dust all the time, Amy, thanks for joining in. Um, in Especially in the springtime, I'm throwing those crickets in a, a, a large deli cup and the dubious as well, and I'm throwing the powder in there, and I'm stirring them around, and I'm feeding, again, right before night, so I'm, I'm getting as much powder on uh, calcium powder as I possibly can on those those uh, feed mature, or feed insects. John wants to know what size enclosures do you use for the one to three crested gecko breeding? Excuse me. Um, Oh, for a one to three. So we have, I'm going to go through this just real quick. So we have, my favorite enclosure is a 20 high or a 20 extra high, if you know those uh, aquariums, a glass tank. Kimberly. Hi, hi Kimberly. Uh, so if you know those tanks, it's it's a great tank. A 20 extra, extra high is a great tank because it provides just enough room for a one, one uh, breeding setup. I've had one twos in there before. Uh, and that seems to work out okay, um, but again, you know, as you add uh, females, I think you, you decrease the number of um, eggs that you're getting for the second, and then for the third, I think the male, I don't know, might focus on um, just breeding with one or two instead of all the females, and I don't know if lose, losing interest is a good word, but or what's going on, but they just don't have enough time or energy to, to breed with every uh, female. So uh, getting back to your question, a 1-3, um, a, a 20 gallon is about as small. Uh, no problem, Andrew. I know you've got a lot going on. Thanks for joining. Uh, make sure you you guys hit the like button. I would have really, really appreciated it and leave comments, you know, uh, leave questions here. Um, but a 1-3, I like to, to use at least a 30 gallon if not bigger. Um, I just like to give the females enough room to, number one, you know, get away from the male if they, they need to, but number two, you know, get away from the other females as well and find some secluded areas where they can and uh, go off and, and hide for a while, especially after laying eggs and they need that a little bit of time to recover. So um, our plastic enclosures, our, our tubs downstairs, we have a few set up for larger groups, uh, larger than um, uh, a one, two, I'm trying to think of the, the, how big those are. Uh, uh, Nanette's saying that they're 58 <coughs> quarts. Um, so what does that, in, uh, calculate out to as far as gallons, but you know, something bigger than a 20, 20 gallon for a one, three. Um, Angie is asking, do you feed the feeder insects differently during breeding season? Not so much, uh, a little bit, um, so during not during the breeding season, you know, I'll throw in crickets and I'll throw in um, dubias in the mealworm cup. But um, in the preparation, hi Elizabeth, thanks for joining. Um, we're talking about breeding and and any questions anybody has on on breeding geckos. Uh, so 
During the breeding season, I, I really don't. I, I guess the only difference that I, I uh, do is um, I'll feed a little bit, a little more frequently during the breeding season. So in the fall and winter, we're, we're maybe feeding insects maybe once every week, maybe once every two weeks, in fact. We're slowing down with our crusted gecko diet. We're not feeding every, every other day. Um, but during breeding season, I'm feeding every other day, absolutely, with in, not with insects, but uh, crusted gecko diet, and at least once a week with insects. If, if I can, I, I try to feed a, you know, more often with, with insects. Christopher said it's 14.5 gallons. Uh, 50? 15. 50. 14.5 gallons is a 58 quart. I think that it's a bigger bigger container than, sorry. Um, Do you use multiple egg laying containers? Uh, Casey is asking 18 by 18 uh, works great for larger groups. Thanks, Casey. Uh, Kevin is saying, do you use multiple egg laying containers in groups of one, three? Um, multiple egg laying containers. Hey, Bill, thanks for joining. Um, uh, Casey, wet, uh, crusty gecko diet, thanks. Uh, multiple egg laying containers for one threes. Um, we just talked about the enclosure for the one threes, but for egg. Oh, I know what you mean. Uh, hides. Um, I don't. You know. And if I'm doing a one three, the females are all. Um, they all look the same. So if I have uh, females that look differently, then I'm pairing them off and I'm, I'm making sure that I, I isolate those genetics and I make sure that I, I know the eggs coming from those females. But as an example, if I have a red group, a, a red male and several females, um, I'll what I'll do is I'll uh, put two females together or three females together and I'll put one la egg laying box in there. Angie wants to know if you feed the feeders differently oh not, not feed the animals differently feed the feeders differently i got gotcha. you actual insect different um i'll uh no i don't um my regime is pretty much to feed the insects uh the same all year round because what i want to do is and and i can't stress this enough uh when i'm feeding the feeders feeding the feeders to the geckos I absolutely uh, want them gut loaded every time that I'm putting those those insects into the uh, enclosures. So I go through a uh, and I'm going to take these glasses off because I'm I'm Nanette's reading off the questions. Maybe this will make it a little bit easier, uh, not so much clearer. But when I'm uh, uh, feeding the insects, I want them to be gut loaded every single time that I I feed them to the geckos. So what I'll do is. Um, Go through, you know, uh, mealworms. Let's take mealworms. I'll uh, keep them over like a uh, an oat material, um, or I'll add uh, like bread or or something as a, a, a stable food. But before I'm feeding, you know, several hours before I'm feeding, uh, four, six, eight hours, uh, sometime during that day, I'm throwing carrots in there. Or something. Uh, I actually use crusted gecko diet, dried crusted gecko diet. I'll throw that in there um, so that they gut load and that the, the uh, animals are getting the benefit from that gut loaded insect. Karen Skinner wants to know when you're going to send Mocha Boy to her and she needs to leave. Leave an address and I'll send uh, Mocha Boy right over to you. <coughs> um, Kevin says, referring to the issues with one laybox as the issues with both females wanting to use the layback spin in the same night. Is there issues? I there might be. That's a great question. Um, I've I've found many occasion uh, when I've had one two uh, one male two females in the same uh, enclosure. What I've found is uh, many times two eggs two sets of eggs in the same lay box. So. I don't really see that as an issue. I've, I've never, ever, on healthy animals, um, I've never, ever found a set of eggs in the lay box and a good, very, very important point here, I've never found a good set of eggs outside the lay box, uh, which would indicate to me that one of the females is deciding not to uh, tangle with the other female and lay outside the lay box. Um, 
I find two sets of, of two eggs in lay boxes um, fairly frequently. Not all the time, but fairly frequently. Hope that answers your question. Any other questions for Nanette? No, not right now. Okay. Uh, Karen has to leave. Thanks for joining, Karen. We'll, we'll uh, let this go just a few more minutes if anybody else has any questions. Um, anybody breeding anything very special to you this year? Uh, something different. I know, Bill, you have a lot of different projects. Um, John wants to know, have you ever rotated male crested geckos between the enclosures with single females? Uh, yeah. Another great question. I'm saying that all the time. I apologize. But it is a good question. I have, um, and I'll, I'll tell you an example right now. I have um, a, I have three tricolor females and I don't want to put them all together going back to the point that I made earlier uh, I want to know the babies coming out of all three of these tricolors so I have a male tricolor that's outstanding I wish I I had them up here and I could pull them out but uh, hi Adam th thanks for uh, thanks for joining um, so what I'll do is I'll take that male and I'll I'll move him from enclosure to enclosure to enclosure the three females and what I'll do is <clears throat> I'll try to move him uh, especially at the beginning of the breeding season, I'll have him in one enclosure for about three days, uh, move him to the second enclosure, three days, three nights, move him to the third, three days, three nights, move him back to his own enclosure for about the same amount of time, and then cycle back through. And usually I'll do that three or four times, and and that's usually good enough to, to start those females ovulating and, and laying eggs. Angie wants to know, where do you put the babies once they hatched? Uh, um, I have a special rack that has, um, I want to say it has to have 90 uh, enclosures, little little tubs. I think there's six or nine quart tubs. And um, so with, uh, I'll, I, I think it's around 90 different uh, uh, tubs with that many. And, and I keep two at a time in, in there. Uh, we're talking about almost 200 uh, baby geckos. So, at sample room, I've also, I at times, I've filled up that rack and had to use little critter keepers. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had to go out and buy new tubs for the babies. But they'll stay in together, two at a time, for about a month, uh, maybe up to six weeks or so, uh, in those small enclosures. And then from there, they'll move out to, um, I think it's a 19-quart um, by themselves individually, and I have uh, several baker's racks. I think that's what you call them. Uh, that I'll move the the um, so they'll go to, from uh, being together in their set of uh, two two eggs laid. Uh, keep the two babies together. They're obviously marked, um, and then I'll move them from there in four to six weeks out to a nineteen quart. Um, Amy wants to know how often you personally clean. Deep clean your enclosures, uh, including the baby tanks. Uh, baby tanks we clean a lot. Um, so it's very, very different. Baby tanks and adults, extremely different. Um, I used to keep uh, tropical fish, and the first lesson that you learn in keeping tropical fish is, and I know I, I think I said this would be a half hour, but I'm going to keep going as long as there's questions. Um, probably not until 2 o'clock tonight, but... Uh, I'll, I'll keep it going. But uh, I used to keep tropical fish, and the first thing that you learn with tropical fish is you never, ever, ever clean the whole tank and the filter and everything. Sorry about the lighting, folks. It's a little, little awkward here. But I never uh, clean everything at one time. So in uh, aquariums, you clean maybe, you take out maybe 20 to 30 percent of the water, and you clean maybe a quarter of the gravel. It's the same thing with adult crusted geckos. So we'll do a deep clean probably about three times a year. That means just completely, you know, taking everything out, scrubbing, uh, cleaning the bottom, washing everything out. But in between those three cleanings, we'll clean, I don't know, about once a month or maybe a little bit longer than that. We'll go through and I have a, um, oh, a putty knife, a flat uh, blade and I, it's a plastic uh, putty knife, and I'll take that and I'll scrape the bottom a couple of times, and I'll get all the 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 solid excrement out, 
and I'll take a razor blade and I'll clean the front uh, glass and maybe some, some of the side glass and back glass. Bottom I don't really clean. I'll wash off the leaves, the plastic plants a little bit. But I really don't worry about a deep clean that often. Um, that's the adult tanks. The baby tanks or the grow out tanks we clean religiously simply because um, I want them to be in as clean of an environment. Um, I have this thought, again, it goes back to tropical fish, that um, there's chemicals released to, um, I guess, slow down the growth of, of other uh, fish in a, a tank. And I think for crusted geckos, other geckos, there might be, you know, the waste and, and other, you know, factors in there might might uh, slow their, their growth down a little bit. I try to do as much as I can to eliminate any factors that might slow down their growth and minimize the, the absolute health of these geckos. So uh, we'll, we'll clean the baby tanks once every couple of weeks or so. And that's a, that's a deep clean. That's take the, and we don't have a lot of decorations in the, those small tanks. We'll take them all out. We'll wash down the tank and put the animals back in. Angie has two questions. Yeah. Or wait, and we'll go back to Amy first. What yeah. What cleaning product do you use? I, <laughs> I don't. I don't like cleaning products. I talked to uh, Nanette actually recently about two weeks ago about using bleach because we have some white uh, dishes that are building up a little bit of a, a plaque on them. Um, and um, she had mentioned that, you know, the de the bleach might be absorbed by the plastic. And that's absolutely not what I want, you know, the geckos to be exposed to. Um, I don't use anything. I, uh, I guess, no, I do use something. I, I use a lot of hot water. So, you know, I'll put dishes and things in in uh, a bucket of hot water. And the second thing I use is elbow grease, if anybody knows what that is. That's just a lot of scrubbing. So when I'm doing a crusted gecko, gargoyle gecko tank, um, it's, you know, pads and we're scraping uh, you know, it's razor blades. We're scraping everything off uh, manually and throwing, you know, hot water in there and rinsing everything out. She just asked also if you ever used Listerine as a cleaner. No. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not a big believer in, in foreign substances. I've, I've not had a, a problem. I've not had any kind of an outbreak. Crusted geckos are very, 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 very resilient. Um, I really don't think that uh, that's... That's really an issue. It's just not something that I've done in the past and probably not something that I'll do in the future. Angie Hi, wants, Boris. Thanks for joining. Angie wants to know if you use regular tap water or treated water. It's yep, not yep. Softened. Um, tap water we use for cleaning. Um, I have bottles. And, and again, this goes back to fish, but I, and I'm sorry for relating it so much. But uh, with fish, if, uh, you know, we lived in Milwaukee when we kept fish, and the Milwaukee water obviously had all kinds of stuff going into it. Uh, but a lot of the, the problem with fish and water coming out of the tap was chlorine, or is chlorine. So <clears throat> um, what I learned was um, not to use tap straight from the, or water straight from the tap, but uh, let I would let it sit for a while. So we have bottles. I, I don't know. We have probably 30 to 40 bottles, uh, little like little spray bottles. And we've taken the, the spray nozzle off. So we'll use the, the plastic bottle and uh, we'll fill them up, set them on a, a shelf and rotate them out. So the water that we're using to fill up water dishes or, or you know, whatever, um, spraying, misting, um, we're using, uh, we're using water that sat for a while and that chlorine has, has uh, leached out of it or uh, evaporated out of it, I should say. Angie also wanted to know, do you ever have any issues with females fighting with a male once he is placed with them? Uh, that's a good question too. So I don't see as much problem of, you know, I, I hear over and over and over again, a male won't accept the female. I, I just don't see that at all. I don't see males beating up females. I see just the opposite. So if I'm introducing for the first time um, geckos together, very first time, I watch that female because the female is the one that dictates, in my mind, the relationship. Um, 
The female is the one. I'm trying to keep this clean. And that's look, giving me this look over here. So the female is the one that will dictate whether the the activity you know goes forward or not. The female is the one that will push off the male. And sometimes if you have a bigger female with a smaller male, you just kind of have to watch that and make sure that they're, they're, there's not too much physical, um, I guess, bantering going back and forth. Garrett, thanks for joining. I appreciate it. Everybody, if, if you haven't already, greatly, greatly appreciate it if you, you throw a like. And there's also a, a thing that you can click and join in future uh, live sessions. Would, would greatly appreciate that if you would, if you enjoy this. And she says, as it should be. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Maybe if Nanette wasn't sit sitting here, I'd say something different. <coughs> Hi, Erin. Thanks for joining. Appreciate it. I couldn't read her message. I've got my... Just said, I said um, that to the same, someone else the other day. Female is the <coughs> risk, not usually the male. Christopher's leaving because he's going back to the car working. Thanks, Christopher. And has, Amy has to go take care of a kiddo. Sounds good. Kids are first. And Kevin said, most anticipated Crested Gecko project this year. Kevin, are you asking me or yeah. are you going to tell me what your most <laughs> anticipated? I'll tell you what mine is if you tell me yours. So uh, mine would be... I've got a couple going. I, I love the Red Harleys. Um, I, I, I'll be very honest. I'm not a huge fan of what you know is hot in the market right now. I love what I love, and I'll always work with the, the animals that I, I love the most, and that's Reds, and I love the Red Harleys, the Red Pinstripes. We're working on a couple of Red Pinstripe projects this year. Um, I have uh, two or three uh, that I'm very excited about as far as Crusteds. I have two or three red Dalmatian projects that I, I really want to kick off, and I'd love to see a red animal with big blotchy ink spots all over it. So that's what, what I'm working on. Garrett, so so I'm waiting for your res reply, Kevin. Garrett wants to know, do you breed any Aussies? Um, Oh, Garrett, um, I used to. Um, I've gotten kind of out of it a little bit. Um Simply because I, I tried to to uh, minimize my uh, collection about two and a half years ago because of work, and um, now I'm just kind of rebuilding. And now that I, I have a little bit more time uh, to the geckos, I'm working with Milai right now. Um, I'm trying to think of um, I'm working with uh, Odura um, Robusta. I believe it is Dan. Help me with the name here. Um, I have a trio of them. Um, I think that's my only Australians. Angie wants to know during breeding season, how dense do you keep the foliage? I, I, I don't really change up the, the enclosures during breeding season, non-breeding season. Um, I, I keep it pretty much the same. So, so my typical, uh, and I'm, I'm, we'll take maybe one or two more questions here and then we'll, we'll wrap things up tonight. Keep it a little bit shorter. Uh, I'm going to jump over to your question in just a second, Angie. But uh, Kevin just mentioned, uh, can you read what? Oh, um, it looks like Exanthic and, and Lily Whites. Lily Whites. Very cool. And, and, and I love the looks of the Lily Whites. And don't get me wrong, Kevin. Uh, it's it's a pretty. beautiful, beautiful, pretty animal. Um, it's just not something that we're working with ourselves. And it's something that I'll, I'm probably going to not get into uh due to the genetics it's just a little bit of a concern for me but um they're a beautiful animal uh so my uh setup for crusted gecko is uh the hide uh mealworm dish uh some some cork bark uh lots of cork bark and probably three or four pieces of big um uh, leafed uh plastic plants uh, enough places for them to crawl around and lots of places for them to hide in. Garrett says you need to get the Diplo Galliantius. Uh, I had those at one time. Um, I had those. I got eggs. I got. <coughs> I did get babies from them. Uh, this is when I was real early on in the, the hobby. Uh, so I was keeping leopard geckos, then got into crustas, and then just went crazy with Australians. Um 
But, uh, yeah, the, some of the animals that are being produced right now, especially uh, some of those animals, some of the more, I'm, I'm going to call them more delicate and rare. You know, everybody sees the, the wheeler eye, uh, but, but not some of the, the really small little geckos like that. Th those are crazy. I, I would love to see them get back into the hobby. One more question, Nanette? show off uh, cayenne pepper here one more time this is a red harley male he's just a youngster so he's falling all over the place hopefully he'll settle down so you get a good, little bit of a uh, shot at him here well i want to thank everybody for joining in i really appreciate the great questions this session um can i say it one more time good questions everyone uh, if you have any other questions, send, shoot me in a message on Facebook and I'll make sure that I answer them. Pam, Hi, Pam. Thanks for joining everybody. Have a good evening.